is about the animal and specifically the jaguar motif in Olmec art. And from as an in introductory art historical talk, it's it's useful to just mention that around the world, animals are anthropomorphized um, in ancient cultures and with many artworks we see these kind of human animal forms and it's a very rich part of of art history whether it's in masks or sculptures or monuments or gargoyles or reliefs this idea of an animal human form and so in our art vocabulary part right because all of all these sections have kind of a, a historical anthropological part and a and our vocabulary part um our history part and we have this idea of metamorphosis and metamorphosis is a classic wonderful art moment art history moment if we use a western art history metaphor of painting the the image plane can be a liminal space between between god between religious um, sentiments uh and the corporeal, the the real, the real world, right? We stand outside of it, and this becomes a space to experience something other than here. And therein lies a crux of experiencing artworks where they set up a perceptual paradigm to experience the imperceptible. Um, and so within that, there's this idea of metamorphosis, of, of becoming, of the things becoming real, of us becoming something with them, of the of these things entering our world and leaving our world through some kind of uh, experience in the artistic boundaries and and limits of the artistic plane. So that's the idea of metamorphosis, and and particular to the jaguar motif of the Olmecs is this idea of the human becoming jaguar or the jaguar becoming human and representing that. And then another art term for this section of the um, Mesoamerican art history talk is the idea of relief. And this is another rich art historical concept, art concept for experiencing artworks. And if we go to make an artwork in the classic sense, um, we have a, a flat work. Uh, a sculpture that you can hold or that you can walk around or that you can throw. And uh, the flat work, right, is something that can be folded or broken or can fall off a wall or, um, but it's, it's flat. And then we have something in between, which is relief. And the, the classic example of relief is, is coin, uh, coins, coinery. And there's a rich history of that. And the, the idea of the American mint and these these heads uh, composed on coins um, throughout history, and those are are packed with with this relief technology, this artistic artistic technology of 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 compressing the three dimensional space onto a flat plane. So so relief is a is a very economical method of representing very deep space, but it also kind of plays a game of both worlds. It, it, it deals with flatness and it deals with depth at the same time. Um, okay, so let's let's move on with with some images. So again, on our right, we have the ID tags for wasps for wasp species that I showed earlier, and I use this with the idea of the jaguar because. As, as heady and elite as we can get about the, the ideas and the metaphorical um, concepts behind, behind reading images and symbols and iconography and the artistic experience, a lot of it is just about retinally, you know, with our eyes, our retinas, our um, rods and cones, identifying differences and remembering them. And um, nature is a is a great place for subtle differences, and it's actually more more difficult than you might think to to recognize songbird species, et cetera, when they all look like small um, gray colored birds. But then then you learn to recognize differences. And looking at artworks is it's it's part of flexing that brain, or at least it, it can be. So how do we identify a leopard 
versus a tiger or a, a lion. And we do this with these rosettes is one way or a larger um, boxier head or a stout body, but that's difficult because then we don't have size reference. So I think it's fun to look at these patterns that each of these, these wild cats exhibit in order to identify the difference between these animals. And, and really that that's kind of a large part of, of experiencing artworks. And then of course, these patterns are going to change depending on age and juvenile and season. Probably I'm, I'm not, a, I don't know a lot about leopards, but here's a coat um, example for baby leopards. So the jaguar is this jungle cat in, in Mesoamerica and art historians have identified the artworks as relating to the jaguar, but now there's a lot of feelings that maybe they don't look like this cat. And so I leave that for you to, to be the judge of. And are these jaguars, are these images I'm showing jaguars or are they other species? And look at these little ears here. We will see those later on in, in our, uh, in our Olmec works, something similar. The jaguar is the third largest cat of our world. There's a lion and a tiger and it evolved to puncture turtle shells is the idea. And so it has the strongest bite per mass, kind of like the otter um, of any of any of the, the largest cats. And so here we are with a jaguar piece from the Olmec time period. This is thought to be a man becoming a jaguar, kind of a metamorphosis moment. And so if we think about the earlier prompts that I've talked about, this idea of the snapshot, right? Is this figure about to move? Um, I just want to give a couple of things to think about. If, if, if you look at this and you don't feel anything, then, then part of art history, or, or at least this series of lectures is art appreciation, right? Like, let's look at this thing. Is this thing about to move? If, if you went away, would it walk down the street? Um, would it become a jaguar? Would it grow wings and fly? Would it hit somebody? Um, or is it simply there to stand there? Or is it, is it, does it exist to be held? Does it exist to be buried in a, in a tomb to deal with, with the spirits of an afterlife? Um, I think it's worth it to zoom in on this figure here. And this is in, again, this is in a kind of fluorescent light, it looks like, where they took this image. But we can imagine how it would pick up light um, from a flame or from the setting sun. But this is just a, a really beautiful rendition in, in, a, in a jadeite, right? A very difficult stone to carve uh, with no metal tools using abrasive substances. Uh, there's decisions of where to be subtle and where not to be. There's this twist of the hands. Um, here's a black and white rendition. But the way the back muscles are, are represented and, and anatomically. So now I'm just showing several figures that have been claimed by our history as jaguar figures. Um, partly there's this, these signifiers of Olmec work that have been decided upon, such as this downturned kind of lip vibe. And then remember, these are, these are from 2000, 3000 years ago. Um, so they've changed quite a bit. There might have been precious stones in the eyes and um, they might have had textiles on them or 
what were they used for? Here's the, the ears. So here's an example of this looks like human ears and animal ears. Um, and then look at the way the hands and the legs are treated differently from the, su the subtlety of the cheeks. And it's almost as if they incised these in order for the the red pigment to to catch those lines. And this is the the standing figure of, of a or a, a figure seated figure of um, somebody offering a a jaguar baby type humanoid. I'm not sure what the word is for a, yeah, it's called a word jaguar in the, in the canon. This is again considered a jaguar type motif. So you can see why I'm calling a jaguar is like a, a sign. It's not necessarily clear that this looks like a jaguar, but that's, that's how we're, uh, that's the referent. And this is kind of a, a random uh, picture of Teddy Roosevelt having killed a jaguar. But I just, I, I like in our historical context to, to bring in um, perhaps the distracting qualities of the motifs because they're, they're real, they exist, and they're in our consciousness. So this is kind of the, the heart of the this section on, on the jaguars that I want to talk about. These are, some people call them celts, but they're, they're also called votive axes. And they, they look like axes. They're like, they're like this from the side, but it's doubtful that they were actually used as wedges for any purpose, right? A wedge is an incredibly useful idea and technology for humans to develop very powerful tool. Um, but here we have a, a wonderful art concept where you can have a representation that looks like the object, but is not for that use. And what does that, what does that mean for us to have things like that, to have, um, to represent something even in the same scale, to play with the idea that it could be used, but is not for use is, is quite interesting. And to bury people with these or, to have them as, as sacred objects. So that's one art historical concept I really want to, to bring to light with these. For example, the uh, Mesoamericans had toys with wheels, but there's no survival surviving examples of carts as there are in the other six pristine civilizations. Um, what could this mean to, to be able to represent something that does not have a, a real use, right? The cart was not meant to carry really tiny food. Um, the use is is in its metaphor and symbolic nature while representing something really close to the functionality. And that's that's a beautiful idea in our history to, to make things like that. So these votive axes are supposedly there's many, many of them in the in the Mesoamerican Olmec archaeological record. And they vary in terms of this relief concept that I want to talk about. So here we have something that looks like a painting on a flat stone, right? But when we get to, 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 to this iteration, we have a combination of uses and you could say on a sliding scale from relief to in the round. So here we have inscription, right? In the way, in, in the same way as the other objects I showed that maybe would have caught that red pigment if, if it had been smeared across it. And a very loose, relaxed, gestural representation of hands and legs and crotch. And then as we move up this object, we see it in, in more relief. The, the space starts to buckle. You could say the space starts to dive in and become become part of our space, our physical space, and it's not as much a representation in a drawn way. And so that's complex to for a culture to decide to represent something 
in multiple with multiple styles. Um, and we can really see how this object changes as you walk around it. And, and I find it qu quite surprising when I finally saw a three quarter photo of this object. It's hard to imagine how deep that area of the face is. And as we walk around it, it, it can open up and that, that can be a quite impressive emotional experience to, to have our own movement uh, bring something to life. And that's a, that's a tool that an artist can use. And again, this is this downturned notion that's found in the Jaguar uh, motif. So just to get into this idea of relief space, um, you could think about it as going to see a play or a movie, and there's these these limits to the space that is the metaphorical place of of, of telling the story. And so the idea of relief is you're is you're compressing the space. So you could think of a, a a painting as having this background, middle ground, foreground, and you could think of of a relief as kind of squeezing that space into into like a pizza box type. Uh, limit. So I'm just going to kind of give a general Western art concept. Um, and maybe it's important to note now the complications of, of constantly doing this, because throughout these talks, I'm using Western art history canon to talk about the Mesoamerican works. And that's a dangerous place to be in, but it's also... Um, my background is in Western art history and many of the schools uh, teach that as the canon. And uh, it's been quite tragic the way that art history has focused on Western art as some kind of epitome of a linear trajectory. And people like Gombrich and other famed art historians have positioned the representation of the Greeks as some kind of evolution from something rudimentary in the Egyptians. And they've, they've expressed it as kind of, there's these, a couple amazing moments in art history where we get these, these, these rising, these rising moments of intelligence. And this is just simply not the case. It's, it's erroneous and, and, uh, and a tragic violence on what's possible in terms of experiencing art. So, I say all that and then I'm referencing Western art history because it's a it's a messy it's a messy paradigm that I'm working with. So this is so this this piece here is the idea of transferring literally from a window onto the picture plane, the space, the landscape outside. And so you you trace basically each small grid to help lay out and uh, get a cohesive image. And this is the classic Dürer uh, example, the, the Northern European Renaissance artists of, of how to transfer a physical sculpture onto a, a flat plane and, and the process of doing that. Um, so, so yeah, there, there's, a, there's a rich, long history of, of how, do we, how do we imprint, how do we represent what our experience is. And in, in this case, it, it's very visually based. How do we correctly visually trace uh, our experience? And when we get to something like the Olmex, I think it's exciting to compare it to the reliefs on these coins. Um, I'm choosing a dime here with Roosevelt from a USA coin. And if you imagine closing your eyes and, and holding this Olmec object, this votive axe, and tracing your fingers across the, the arms and the chest, it's this kind of low relief, right? Maybe hard to, to figure out what's there. And as you get up to the head, this object becomes in, in the round. And that's, that's quite a fascinating decision. And to be able to express eloquently with relief is a is a skill and the the mint the has a has been working on that skill here's another votive axe 
so I'm bringing in these are historical terms of of relief and and three dimensionality and kind of sliding scale that's available to to a culture and an artist. And no pun intended, there's an economy to to the material. If you can get a lot out of a little, right? You can get a lot of space out of a a quarter of an inch, an eighth of an inch. Um, that's that's important. That's something to think about. Now, to make the story more complex, it it turns out this this woman has made the claim, and many people have that the uh, the dime of Franklin Roosevelt is uh, made by her, that it was her drawings and her plan that she presented to the mint and that this gentleman took credit for, for the final piece. And it's his name on, on the dime as the artist. He claims he sourced many different images to come up with the final piece. So in a way, we could look at this idea of metamorphosis and becoming in terms of becoming from flat to three-dimensional, coming becoming from inscribed and drawn to, to in the round. Right? We can stretch this idea of metamorphosis. This is one of my favorite examples of a sculpture in the relief in Assyrian, the Assyrian stoneworks. Um, made a huge impression on me when I was a um, teenager going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The Assyrian wing is really special to see these, these texts inscribed. And when we look at these full figure pieces compared to something like the, um, the Olmec piece that uses both uh, something that can be held and something that can be read with your hands in this relief way, um, when we see like a kind of freeze, this is more of the freeze tradition, right? Which we we saw in Egypt. Um, all kinds of poetic moments can occur in terms of the twisting of the full body and what's behind and what's in front and what's to be read and what's to be experienced. I'm going to show a couple more Olmec figures now. Again, we're in this, this jadeite land, this very hard, precious stone that is thought to be like gold. Um, it's interesting to say that it's the same for ancient Chinese artwork. There's, there's an old saying um, from China about jade being worth more than gold. And This is a somebody carrying an Olmec type baby. And this is another picture. And this is where I want to bring back the idea of identification and memory. Do you think these two are the same sculptures? Show them back and forth one more time. So the easiest thing to note is that the break in the leg looks like it's in exactly the same place. And this is a perfect moment to look at how a sculpture changes depending at the angle um, uh, from which you're looking. Now, of course, we have a different lens, a different lighting. One's in the museum, one's in the back room of the museum, maybe. Um, but look at the countenance on the face of this figure. First on the, the gentleman holding the baby, the jaguar, the word jaguar figure, and then at the countenance of the baby, and they, they change dramatically. Or even look at the way the arm on the, the jaguar baby holds the man. The, the jaguar baby's right arm clings differently as we look from a upper perspective and as we look from a lower perspective. I would say the word Jaguar baby on the left looks less friendly in a way. Maybe the man looks more forlorn. 
in one of them than the other. So this is this is this art history uh, tradition of comparing. What does it mean to compare two images and talk about their differences? I'm going to show some more of these moments of of offering. I'm saying offering, but kneeling with a with a childlike figure versus standing holding a childlike figure. And again, this is the jaguar in a monument type form. Now I'm gonna show some other animals. This is a harpy eagle. This animal exists in the uh, similar ecosystem. And this is a sculpture of a bird. Um, does it look like the harpy eagle? And does it even make sense to show a real animal with respect to the to these Olmec sculptures? And what does that do to them? Um, I think that's worth worth looking at in art history. There's a there's a tendency, there's a desire to find the referent often with photographs what what is it a depiction of but i think that question says more about um, a concept of art history than, than actually looking for an answer here again we we have a human ear with an earring we have a combination of inscription very playful inscriptions on a pedestal a three-dimensional shape but what's interesting about this is, is the artist definitely plays this is from the front the artist definitely plays with the compression of this object as you walk around it kind of largeness from the back and the front and that that dissipates as you or from the side and from the back that kind of dissipates as you see it from the front Right, eyes play trick on tricks on us. Here's some Olmec. Uh, again, this pedestal pedestal form is quite uh, deft. It's quite um, classy to to have a a pedestal form from this era. the fish object, some kind of an armadillo type shape. And then there were, it's interesting that at San Carlos, um, or San Lorenzo, sorry, at San Lorenzo, there were many, many of these toad bones found. And the, the these are inedible. They're incredibly, uh, they're poisonous to eat. And they found a lot of dog bones. They think that the Olmecs ate dog for for protein and for, for meat. They didn't have livestock. And they found a lot of these toad bones. So there's the supposition of kind of religious hallucinogenic practices. So just to, to recap... Um, we went through this idea of, of a jaguar motif and this art history concept of, of anthropomorphizing a form and how art can talk about metamorphosis, how sculpture can talk about metamorphosis, both in terms of this, this theatrical moment of a thing, of a thing having life and moving, and at the same time, metamorphosis between these, these liminal spaces of our corporeal reality and some kind of transcendent 
uh, transcendent experience. And within that, we're also just talking about the retinal appreciation of the human ability to recognize small differences between forms and to hold those in our memory for some period of time. And that the, the fact that those memories can shift and change on us is, is something that art always also works on as we walk around an object and forget where we came from. So all of these are, are laid into the making of a work. And then we really looked at the idea of relief uh, and this history of Western art of a projection onto a flat plane of, of a three-dimensional space and the idea of a, an economy of mark, an economy of means. In other words, to, to get a lot out of a little by by carving a, an infinite space or or a sculpture that appears to be in the round um, in a in a small dimension such as a as a clay tablet or on a wall and the idea of relief being able to talk both in terms of flatness and depth and and the interesting space that that it can hold in that way and, and this opens up a whole landscape of art appreciation from the Egyptians to the Assyrians um, and not just to look at uh, a sculpture in the round as of a figure from from Greece as kind of some epitome of storytelling because it's just a uh, it's a tragic way to think about what our what our world has to offer us